Sedak Mas is an esteemed DJ and producer who released on labels such as Soma, Figure, Clergy and Workdem. He has also launched his own imprint SK11 and recently expanded it with the series SK11X to host artists such as Jant, Farah, David Lohelein, Arkan and Border One. For those of you who still don't know him, he is an artist who played in some of the world's best techno clubs such as Berkheim, Tresor, Glazart, Lehman Club, Fabric, Fabric Madrid, Warehouse Element and Strat, and many more. In this conversation, we talk about Sam's personal story and how he developed and nurtured his passion for music, the story behind his label SK11, and the reason, or better, the artist, why he launched SK11 slash X. We have also a truthful conversation about struggling with demos, releasing on other labels, and the importance of getting music in the right hands. As we hear how much he values quality and personal vision, we also discover one of his biggest personal value, kindness. Without further ado, enjoy this chat with Satalk Mas. All right. <laughs> Very nice to have you here. I can Thank see your you. cat. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> She's always with me, bless her. Nice. At least you have, you have a company. <laughs> Got some company, oh yeah. Distracting me from the studio, actually. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> And, and talk, talk about your studio. I know you have a um, premiere coming up tonight. Uh, Freddy K yeah. is being, he's going to release something from you. Do you want to yeah. tell us more about that? Yeah. So on, on my label SK11, uh, I started this new series called the SKX series. This is going to be for uh, other artists outside of myself. So the first one was from Yant. Second one was David Lawline. Mm -hmm. I still don't know how to pronounce it properly. Um, the third one was a border one for Farah, and now this is number five. This is Arkan, and he's um, he's a producer from Paris. This is going to be his first vinyl, so I'm really happy to put it out for him. I think he's got some nice talent, and he's he's doing that, he's doing good music. That, that's amazing. I know David Lohan. Uh, I think he did um, a video some time ago that I, I found quite impressive. Yeah, uh, he's uh, from Germany, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, he's from Stuttgart. Yeah, he's from Stuttgart. Stuttgart. Yeah, there's a whole little crew of them. There's um, there's him and Rove Ranger and um, who else is there? There's another couple of guys, and they all live together, and they're all kind of like you know sharing production tips. So they're all getting really good all together. You know, they have the crew. A really, yeah, a little crew. <laughs> yeah, it's very, super cool. And and how are you selecting them? How are you getting in touch with them? Are you proactively? Most most of the time it's from tracks that i've heard like from from producers that i've heard and i want to kind of keep it in the family i don't want to spread too too far out of uh out of this zone i don't really want to release people that i don't know so much i want to kind of keep it all in the same because i have yant he's a guy from manchester then also upcoming after arcan is another yant release and then after that is rene wise and I've known Re I've known uh, Rene Wise, and I've known Yant for a few years. Mm -hmm. um, so I want to kind of keep it keep it all a little bit in the family. And I know I know Border One, I know Farah, so I kind of know them all already. So yeah. to so so he's, he's, sorry, go ahead, Duan. It's difficult to like accept demos from people, to be honest, because maybe the music is good, but I, I I like to have that personal connection as well. Yeah, and it seems like in, in these cases, like you have been listening to their music uh, and somehow you know them, you know their work for a while. Yeah. And eventually now you have the opportunity to release them and you already have the connection. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's really like that. Yeah. Yeah, with, with, with the, actually Yant was the one that made me start the SKX series because wow. he, he was the first one and he was sending me such good, Sam, such good music. Sam, sorry to interrupt. I think there's yep. no audio coming from your microphone on your phone. Let's okay. see. Okay. Let's see if it's... There's just noise. Hmm. Uh, is your phone connected to a, mi a microphone, external microphone or no? No, 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 no. Um, let's type it in. Maybe it's because I turned down my... Uh, volume, possibly. Volume. Fixing. It's gonna hear you. Fixed, fixed. I think it seems that now it's working. Yes, fixed now. Right. Okay. <laughs> Technology. Let's see. Let's see if it's gonna carry on. Because I've got it on the on my laptop. I don't know whether that's like uh 
causing noise to my laptop, you know? Ah, uh, it could be, but I, I can see there is a fixed. Okay, the same fixed. Amazing. Yes. Okay, okay, keep good. Going. Good. And so going back, so Jant was the person that, uh, for whom you started the new series. Yeah, 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 it really was. Yeah, because he was sending me such good music for so long, and I was like, I can't, I can't just sit on this. It's got to be, it's got to be out there. And yeah. that that first release that he did, like it was being played for by everyone, you know, DVS One, Freddie K, all over, all over the world, people were playing this release. So I knew that it was strong, and I really. He's so talented that it's really nice to give him uh, give him an opportunity that maybe maybe another label wouldn't give him that opportunity so easily. Yeah, and I'm sorry, Dan. I think there's a still gone. It's, it seems to be maybe that the phone is uh, too mm. close to the fan of the. You know these new MacBooks are so shitty. Uh, Bad audio. This. Hmm. Uh huh. Let me uh, let me just come off it for a second. I find a little place. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay, I'm just gonna. We are fixing. What's on my phone now? <laughs> the screen on my phone it went like gray, gray for a second, frozen. Okay. Uh, could be the ventilator. I don't know. Probably the ventilator, these new MacBooks are so loud. Um, yeah. It's totally fine on Facebook. And you know what I'm going to do also? I'm going to share the link on, uh, yeah, on Instagram. I'll share the link to the video. Yeah. So worst case scenario, we divert to Facebook. I need to just find something to pop my phone on, you know? Yeah. Uh, guys on Instagram, just join us on Facebook. I think it's going to be better. I'm going to share the link in a second. Um, copy link. I got a little prop now, but... Okay. I just have to request to join again. All right. Yes. Let's try like this. Okay. I'm waiting for, and in the meantime, I'm going to share this, that video. Yeah, let's see right, how it perfect. is now. This, this little prop is not so good, but <laughs> try and work with it. Hold on, yes. Okay, so let's try, let's try. And, uh, all right, so yeah, we were talking about Yant. Yant yes, was- Yes, still talking about Yant. <laughs> you don't <laughs> start with him. You, you, it, when, when was the first release that we released um, music? A year ago? One year ago, I think. What are we in now? I think it was exactly one year ago. Yeah, because I saw something come up on my, uh, on my memories that it was one year ago, yeah. So it's been one year and it's now, it's now up to five releases in this SK11X series. So yeah. I think now, now I've, I've already planned a lot for 2021, so it's almost full. Yeah. And okay. I mean, uh, they're saying it's all good now. Right. Amazing. So, yeah. Well done. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. Okay. So it basically, that is another question that, that comes, that keeps coming with a lot of labels that I'm speaking with yeah. is, uh, it seems that 2020 has been an, Without any doubt, uh, it's been a tough year for everyone. Yeah, definitely. In general. That's, that's why we're all here now. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, and, and, and then, like, so you planning, have you had to delete, delay your releases in 2020 to 2021? Have I postponed some releases? Yes. Actually, um, with, um, with the main label, with SK11, which is the one that's just kind of for myself, um, I put out that SK11 number nine in September and it sold out 300 copies in, in about five days or a week. Wow. So it was actually quite good. So then I think people are still buying music. I'm, uh, I didn't postpone any releases. I was just kind of maybe a little bit l less motivated or lazy. And also I was a little bit scared to put out releases because you know, I don't want to lose money with the label. I don't want it to get recognized. I don't want to miss like a, good EP that doesn't get recognized. Yeah. So, um, 
but it seems like copies are still selling well. I'm still speaking to a lot of other people running labels and they're still selling a lot of copies, you know, like Kaiser just did this KSL five. Yeah. And he says it sold out in one week. So yeah. it seems like customers are still supporting the music, which is really good, even if clubs are still closed. Yeah. It could even be that, okay, so maybe the extra income that people are not spending on uh, live events, clubs, yeah. maybe that it's, goes into... Exactly. Right. I think so too. People have maybe a little bit more cash to to spend in in, uh, in record shops and stuff, which is really nice to actually continue supporting artists because this year has been, I mean, in, in, in eight months, I probably played less than 10 gigs, which is normally I would do in like six weeks or something. So, yeah. It, 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 yeah, for live gigs has been <laughs> uh, yeah. the shittiest year for now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so in terms of like, so you're planning the 2021, how do you schedule releases? Like, do you look it's, at... I'm not so good at that, to be honest. Uh -huh. I'm not so good at that. I and Now I just put in three releases uh, um, at one time because I was kind of behind with everything. And then I got all the tracks and like everything came at once. So I just put them all through the distribution all at the same time. And you know, there's a bit of waiting time with, uh, with the pressing plant because they're at limited capacity, how many workers they can have. Um, so yeah. the schedule, so scheduling now I have one coming out every, uh, from, from the beginning of February till March It's going to be one every month. And then hopefully I will continue kind of in a similar pattern, maybe take a summer break and then September, I will, uh, I will start up again and hopefully have September, October, November. Yeah. All kind it, of lined up. Yeah. So in, that would be alternating your releases on SK 11 plus SK 11 X. Yeah. I, I'm, releases. I'm, I'm more like, I'm more motivated to do SK 11 X and put out them tracks because it's going to be for more different artists. And I think if you have five to mass EPs a year, then it's going to become a little bit saturated. So. Yeah. In your, in your experience, like, uh, have you seen, is there anything you do when you are putting out a record or a release to ensure that gets the visibility it deserves? Um, you mean from like promotion or? Yeah. Promotion. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, so it's in the past I've worked with PR companies. Um, yeah. I have worked with them a number of times and that often it's quite sad because sometimes the way the music industry works is that only some certain magazines will take reviews or stuff like this if it's being pitched from a PR company. Right. Um, uh, other than that, I think that social media is just still such a big, big part of this, uh, part of this game. People are, people really respond to it on social media. And I think that's the only reason why I can put out, say, Arkan on the next SKX because because of the reach, and I can just I can just uh, put out this EP and say that I trust it, and it's most people are kind of responding to that, right? And and say that like, you know, it's it's good music, yeah. Um, so it's not something that I do exactly in every line or in every release because I'm not so structured like that. I don't have two weeks to the release. I put SoundCloud out. I don't do this. I just, you know, on that random, random day and I was shit, I should put the clips up. Not so yeah. organized. It seems like you, you have an audience that is listening to your sound, that's appreciating your sound. I mean, I, I'm seeing on Instagram, people are like sending love messages <laughs> uh, since we started. <laughs> uh, and th that's, um, that's great. And yeah. do you, th so uh, if I, if I understand correctly, like you, you started with PR agencies, getting their support to get the music out there. Eventually you you built your audience successfully and somehow yes. you have some kind of two way conversation with your audience. Yes, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. I think I'm really happy that they respect what, what I do with the label. And I also try it. I also try as much as I can to, to do things like on these band camp Fridays, you know, 50% off the catalog or doing like little quirky competitions. People can win a record or giving away some stuff for free. Like at the start of, uh, at the start of Corona, my whole band camp was online for free. Wow. Um, for, for at least four months, I put my whole catalog up for free because I wanted to share something with, with the people while they may be stuck at home. I just need of to, course. uh, I just need to, my cat's playing with something she shouldn't be playing with. Of course. <laughs> hey, guys, we'll be back.
<laughs> we have a cat situation to solve. Uh, all right. She's controlled now. Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So in and basically, so you you are now in a position where you have an audience that respects your music, follows you. Yeah. Have you have you figured out how many of them are, let's call them returning customers or returning fans? So oh, I think I think I think ninety percent of them. I would like to I would like to hope that the music continues on at a level that people are still respecting it, because it's it's difficult because. I think uh, over the past three years, you know, there's been a lot of change in the techno scene. You've seen some really good hypnotic techno artists start changing to this hard sound. So it's, it's I like to st try and st stick to my roots. And if people like that, then they're going to continue following. Yeah, I, I love this topic. It's, it's uh, in a way, like it, 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 I've seen so many different opinions on this. And, and I think I have come to the conclusion that there's not, right or wrong answer is what works for you yeah is it's it probably, yeah it's it, i mean i've spoken to some of these guys like i'm friends with them and like I've, I've said to them in a joking way like what happened to the old like xxx person and they're like well you know i like this new, i like this new techno sound i like the hard harder sound and stuff so i mean it's all a part, matter of their opinion at the end of the day like if they like it then that's fine but for me it's i like to stick to stick to what works and not just from a sense of uh you know getting more gigs or something yeah and of course and l let me ask you a question from uh, i want to ask you a question from two different perspectives because you, you run a label and you also are an artist yourself of course yeah. from a label perspective if you were to start over and let's say if you put yourself in the shoes of someone who's starting a label now who loves a particular sound that might not be the main one right now. Yeah. What would you tell them to encourage them to stick to that and be and believe in their vision more than what the market is saying? Well, exactly. You just got to believe in yourself and really and really concentrate on that. And, and I mean, if it doesn't work from the first try, if it doesn't work from the first try, then you really have to just stick to what you do. Don't start like putting a release out under this sort of kind of style and then start going like this when it doesn't work and go like this because this sometimes happens I can see this happening with some some things maybe it doesn't work in this one style and then they start trying to go with another one you really have to stick to what you do because I think for instance the SK11 label maybe only started getting popular after the fourth release or mm -hmm. the fifth release you know so um and if you get it into the right hands and the music is good quality, then it's kind of a win-win situation because you need to you need to know the DJs which are going to play their certain sound. You need to get that music into their hands somehow with like a maybe you know them, maybe a friend knows them, or maybe you send an email say this is really for yeah. you. Like you know, there's a lot of people like. Uh, you know, Ben Sims has his radio show that he's playing a lot of like unknown artists sometimes. So um, it's just all about getting it out there and, you know, getting on track listings and stuff. Because some people are always going through track listings and they just, yeah. they don't even listen to the mix. They just copy and paste that into YouTube. And yeah, find tracks, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean, I mean, hate is a good one for YouTube. I mean, they, yeah, it's a different topic, but they, is, they yeah. do have a good, they have a, do have a good platform. Yeah. And if you get your track on like a good platform, such as uh, Hate, or you get them on a good YouTube uh, and a good SoundCloud premiere, then I think, yeah, then yeah. you're kind of in a winning position. Yeah. It, it, and it takes time. It might not be. It takes time. It, oh, it takes a lot of time. It takes a lot of patience. And then we, and the music, you know, you have to work on this for five years before you start releasing records, in my opinion, because, <laughs> because you know, you get, I mean, production wise, you mean production wise. Yeah. yeah. Unless you're a bit of a whiz kid, then, you know, you really have to, you really have to have that craft down before you start. That's why a lot of, that's why a lot of DJs and producers, they are 30 plus. Mm -hmm. I mean, there is a new generation of uh, kids now, you know, there was a new generation of 21 to 25 now, like Yant and Rene Wise of this Floors, who's I think in the chat now. Um, yeah. They are a lot younger, but that's because now, I guess, you know, you're going home from school, you're making music, you're not playing on The Sims or you're not on MSN anymore. 
Yeah, and I, I think also, I mean, there's uh, the accessibility factor. So probably the music music making is becoming uh, much easier. So people getting have easier, yeah. Getting easier. And also, I think that in the last five years, probably it became a much bigger role model for a lot of uh, young uh, people, right? So yeah. I, I, I don't know, I, I'm thinking about a lot of people who might just see big DJs now, or there's a lot of publicity around DJs. It became like a cool job and profession to have, Yeah, right? it really did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Especially over the last year, the yeah. last few years, very recently, it became <laughs> this hype. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And 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 I, I guess the natural uh, implication of that is that even younger people start to make music earlier. Yes, indeed. Uh, yeah. I mean, there was that kid around, what's his name? Uh, I forgot his name. He was, he was like some wonder kid. And he was like, uh, I remember when I was like 21, 22, and he came to play at the clubs in like Leeds and stuff. And he was, Happer, he's called. called Happer. Happer, yeah. Yeah. And he was like coming to the club with his parents because he was like underage to get into the club. He was like 16, 17, and he was coming to play these gigs, you know? Yeah. <laughs> That, that's crazy, uh, and I think he's the wizard. He's the classic uh, wizard kid. Yeah. Guy. I mean, uh, depending on whether people know or or like his music, but I mean, he's really good at producing. Yeah, he, Very yeah, special as well. Definitely. <laughs> uh, and uh, I'm thinking more from a, now from a producer producer perspective. When you're starting off and you are crafting your, you mentioned like five years seems to be like a good amount of time that it takes for you to make something that is ready to be yes. sent out. Yeah. So two questions around that. First of all, I know you have some kind of ritual and process uh, to understand when the track is ready. Yeah. And I would like to know more about that. And the second one is that when you release it and you see that the track is not picking up immediately, how would you think about uh, the next release or, you know, the, what comes after? Yeah, it's, it's for me, if I can listen to that track on, on repeat for days, which has happened with some of my, with some of my tracks, I know that it's, I just have a very, uh, a very instinctive, no, just know that it sounds right. And I know that it's gonna, I know that it's working. And if it works for me, that's, for me, that's kind of all that matters. At the end of the day, it's a very selfish way to look at it, but I just make music for myself. And if it's if it's resonating with other people, then that that's a that's just a plus. That's just a win, really. Um, because the way that the SK11 started and that was all my own music is just that you know, I I think we spoke about this in emails, like a lot of people in the past let me down and uh they they said promise me releases and then they never came around and huh. you just you just have yeah. to know and then when when you're finishing tracks you just kind of know that they're ready i don't know how it works but i don't like to think too much about it to be honest i like to just make the music and then it's all just a mess it's all just a chaos yeah and then and then when i sit down and listen to the final piece then i know that it's i know that it's ready i don't I don't, I rarely go back to projects and fine tune them so much. I'm starting to get, starting to get a little bit better with that, to be honest. But it's, in the beginning, it was just all throw it out there and just like, yeah, like throwing it, darts, definitely. It's, it's amazing. I, I think it's, it's one of the, I don't know, it's a um, skill to mm. be able to be, first of all, confident, but also to be able not to had to spend so much time in actually going back and fine tuning the snares. Yeah, it yeah, sounds exactly. <laughs> a bit too high pitch. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, it's all just a little bit of confidence, and I think that confidence was kind of built from people saying no to me, and I was just like, well, actually, I know that I know that that's ready, and I know that I like it, and I want to do something with it. And if somebody was like, well, I don't know, I mean, obviously, I'm not going to put out like something really sh like badly mixed or something i mean there's there's levels of understanding and levels of using reference tracks and listening to other music and thinking oh well my track kind of sounds up to that level you know yeah yeah have you have you ever thought about uh, what could be the reason why a label like, rejects you or you know they promise a release and then they disappear have you spent some time thinking about what happens it happens all the time i hear it from people now that tell me like oh it's going to release there and then it never happens you know the story of ritzy lee for instance with clockworks that was all over facebook uh, no. a few weeks ago saying that ben clock was like uh holding tracks back and he never released them and stuff like this i mean it's uh, all it's all just about speaking to the person at the right time because 
sometimes you can send an email and they'll miss it. But then another time they'll, they will receive that email and then they'll be online and ready to, ready to respond to you. Yeah. And it, hap it happens with me as well. You know, I get an email and either I'm there or I'm not. So it's, some people, sometimes people can change their mind on tracks, which is fair enough. They like them to begin with. And it's quite difficult to tell somebody that like, oh, I don't like this track anymore when they've already said they liked it. So it's a hard balance to be a, to be a label owner and having to let people down. I do understand that now, definitely. But it's just all about perseverance. Like you don't want to annoy people, but like you can, you can send follow up emails. You can send another one or another batch of tracks, you know, definitely. It's all, and, then, and then if it doesn't work then you have to go somewhere else, if you feel like your music is ready, then you can, you can easily go to the next level. Don't hold all your hopes on one thing because it's like putting all your eggs in one basket. Like you want to just separate some stuff. Right. And then otherwise you start your own label and you, otherwise you start your own label. Exactly. And you build from the ground up. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And in terms of like, so if you are a producer and for whatever reason you get rejected, your label yep. doesn't, sorry, your track doesn't get released or accepted by a label. Yeah. Like you mentioned a couple of things already, like you, you go to the next label that you like, you yep. start your own label. Like how do you manage the rejection? I mean, have you ever had that problem? Yeah, Cause that yeah. seems to be huge for a lot of producers, me oh, definitely. for everyone. Yeah. I had, I had something when I was quite young, when I was like 21, I was going to sign on this label that I really liked. And up until the day of the master and I, I sent, I sent him an email in the evening when I, when I was meant to get mastered. And I was like, Hey, like I was young. I was like, Hey, like, do you have the masters already? Like thinking like super keen. I was like, wow, I'm going to release on this label. And then, um, and then he just emailed me back that the next morning saying, yeah, it's not going to happen. No. Like, what the fuck? I'm like, you fucking wanker. I've been waiting like three months for like this came to this date, which was meant to be mastered. And they were like, yeah, we changed our mind on it. Actually. I'm like, are you kidding me? But you don't, you, do, you don't want to like, you don't want to hold it too much to heart, to be honest, because at the end of the day, you never know like the position that other people in, maybe they can't afford to do the release. Maybe they didn't have the guts to tell you. You have to, it's a level of being a little bit kind, even though these people may be a little bit yeah. ass assholes, but don't hold it too much to heart, you know, onto the next thing. You've got to keep that confidence up. If you feel it's right, then take a couple of months, work on some new tracks, go and go and fire again. It's all about confidence. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. And I think someone on Instagram at Erebu studio is saying, uh, uh, yeah, in the last 10 years, it seems that a lot of labels have shut down their demo doors, basically, uh, which I think is a good segue for me to ask another question. It's like, have you seen ways that work better than others to send demos or present your music to other owners? It's a really difficult one. Yeah. yeah. Um, for the bigger labels kind of, it's almost, I hate to say, but it's almost impossible. Um, for instance, when I signed to figure, you know, I was, I've been best mates with Cleric since I was like 11 years old. Mm. I came to Berlin when he was playing at Bergheim. We all went for a figure meal. I got introduced to Len Faki. Um, me and Cleric had already done a couple of tracks together, which Len had heard. And it was around the same time that I started my SK 11 release. And when I got back from Berlin, I went back to Manchester and I sent, uh, I sent Len the release. I sent him the SK 11 release. He was like, oh, wow, I really like this. I met you with Jordan at the weekend, didn't I? Yeah. And I was like, yeah, 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 he did. And he was like, wow, I'd love to hear some more stuff from you. So it was never really sending demos. It was like kind of, I don't know how it worked exactly, but you know, I, I sent out a lot of demos when I was younger and you know, you you know, hey, how's it going? I'm Sam, I'm 21, I'm from Manchester. <laughs> it's really, it's, it's so difficult, honestly. It is, it's yeah. so difficult. It is. Just, and there's so much good music out there as well that people are making and it's, it, go, it goes unheard because sometimes people don't have the time. And of course, I mean, they, as you mentioned before, the level, go ahead. No, it's turned down this radio. Uh, no worries. And, um, <laughs> As you mentioned before, when you then make the shift and you also start your own label, you will realize that time is limited. You have shitloads of stuff to do for your <laughs> life, work, label, and then you get demos. And unfortunately, you can't take all of them. It's exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's yeah, the other uh, side. And you know, 
it's very difficult because sometimes I'll click on a demo to my label email and it will be completely irrelevant to what I'm doing. And there's, there's so much, people are just like, there's some producers out there which don't really know their sound that they, they're making all this stuff. They just copy and pasted emails to like <laughs> a, a BCC of like 200 emails and just fire it. And they don't care if it's released digitally. They don't care if it's released on a 40 person VA or something. They just want to have a track signed. So, and then there's other people out there that carefully send an email directly to me and it gets missed because there's a lot of junk out, like a lot of people sending junk out there because so many producers nowadays as well. Yeah, of course. The, the amount of tracks that is being produced is probably, I mean, the amount of track release is, I think it's 40,000 per month or something. <laughs> yeah. Or per day. This is like music well, wise uh, on Spotify. So there is an amount other tracks that are not released on Spotify. So the number is bigger and there is another amount which is tracks being made. So yeah, oh, it's huge. It's huge. Just, it's, so many people. What else is there to do? You got just got to make music. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Especially now. <laughs> and let, let's talk about luck versus uh, a plan and strategy. You, you seem to be doing. Uh, I mean, I guess like in a lot of ways. Well, you're happy with your music. You have your label. You are now capable of releasing music for other people. Yeah. Um, how much of that is? Do you think uh, it is due to planning? And how much of that is due to luck? Just a series of events that happen. Yeah, yeah. Um, luck versus planning. You have to have a plan to start off with. You have to know the direction that you want to go. You want to go in, and then I think 50-50, To be honest, because sometimes you be you're in the right time at the right place. You release that EP at that one time, and and you get somebody starts playing it. You know. Um, and there's there's there is a level of planning because you need to know what you want to do with your artistic career you want to know like um for instance if you are going to start releasing your own music you want to have the artwork direction you want to know you want to know your sound um you maybe want to have your first three eps kind of already planned out which may change but have like a direction that is the sound that you want to push yeah um so and then another side of it is luck you know it's like sometimes a record can sell really well and other times the record can sell really bad even though they're they're equal or maybe the one that sells bad just didn't get picked up by picked up by people it wasn't a hot like it wasn't a hot record you know so it is very there is a lot of luck involved in on in all this yeah was there anything specific that in your experience it was uh, like a, a <laughs> a big luck in your uh, journey mm. that you were like fuck i didn't expect that to, <laughs> that thing blew off <laughs> well um there's been a few points where i'm like maybe it's more surreal like when i was at deck mantle in 2016 like Je jeff mill was playing my track when i was there with all my wow. friends that was crazy um but there's like surprises um when i got an email from berkheim to say that they wanted me to have a gig there for the first time and they sent i didn't have an agent or anything they just emailed me that was from Spe that was from spencer park he like gave my record to the to the booker when i just released some work them and then like the tuesday morning even before spencer could tell me i had like this inbox and i was like whoa <laughs> that was that was pretty crazy yeah feels like a lifetime ago now do, do, you, do you remember like this specific moment or like were, were you feeling something different in the air like or <laughs> <laughs> spiritual spiritual I'm fairly spiritual yeah <laughs> there must have been something in the air that morning yeah wow it's uh, uh, uh it must have been like a great moment like to to see that like your music is appreciated by jeff yeah Mills, definitely Spencer yeah Parker, Becca, yeah and, yeah Beautiful. Oh, it was really crazy. Yeah, yeah. When when Jeff Mills has played, I think he only played like one track of mine, but even that's enough, you know. Yeah. Yeah, he was yeah, playing it like for the whole festival season. Like I was going on YouTube like every Monday, like checking out the videos. And it's like he's playing it there, <laughs> all over. That was in his wow. playlist for the summer. Pretty cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah definitely. And um, so this is kind of um. Uh, related question to tracks and actually good tracks 
-hmm. Was there any track from other artists that you wish you had released on SK11X or? Oh, that I wish I'd released. Um, from someone else, like some track that you really appreciate. Yeah, wow, there's so much. You know, I, I remember you asked me this one, but I can't remember like exactly which tracks. There's, I <laughs> can't can remember be. exactly. But I, you know what, I, I want to release all Quartz tracks. <laughs> of course, Quartz, yeah. Yeah, Mar Mario is the best. Mario, yeah. Um, Mario is the best producer out there right now, for sure. Yeah. It's insane. Yeah. He, he, there's a track from him, the uh, silence turns into violence. Wow. Yeah, yeah. I don't know oh, if you remember I, that one. It's like... Maybe on his label, wasn't it? Uh, I, I think so. It's silence. very old. It's like yeah. 2012, 2011. Oh, really, so really interesting. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know that there's a lot of like old Antigon stuff, which I really like. Yeah. yeah I, I used to love this old Antigon stuff. Um, yeah. Make the bells. <laughs> 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 wow, that track. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, and so w one, one thing that was very interesting, I saw that you, you released a sample pack recently, about yes. a month ago. Yeah, it was, yeah. Uh, can you walk us through the process of creating a sample pack and putting it out? So the main, the main idea behind our sample pack was to, to give, give people a part of my productions, which obviously that's what a sample pack is, but I wanted to give them the, you know, the high quality stuff. So I went back through most of my old projects from, from around two years. So, for instance, I went into True Lies, which is like one of my most famous tracks. I got the kick drum from there. I got the hi hat from there. All, all process, the the sub bass, everything out there is like it's like kind of remix packs in a way because they took the kick kick drum from a lot of a lot of different tracks. Um, I then made I made a lot of um, the synth lines with um, my Prophet Rev Two. Um, and the Yachoria Beatstep Pro, and I recorded the sequences through that, and most of it is run through like some analog bits of gear, um, like the analog heat, and um, and I bought this DP4, which is like this is an external effects processor, which has this amazing reverb on it. So it's all it's all run through some nice nice bits of kit. Um, and most of the drums are from like various different projects and then i have like all the uad stuff so i i ran it through this uh shadow hills mastering compressor wow. um and yeah it was it was quite an easy process yeah um and it's all you know but it's it's all i was really scared to do one because i was like you know what people are just gonna end up sounding like me or but from from what i've seen people have sent me videos and they're really taking, taking it in their own ways. You know, some people are producing a little bit slower. Some people are producing faster. Um, I really like what people are doing with it. So I'm happy that I did it in the end and I took away my fears of like, oh, it's only mine. I'm going to keep this for myself, you know, but at this moment right now, like I said earlier, it's about sharing and it's about like giving people some stuff. And I mean, um, the process, yeah, it was. It's all going through old projects, and um, it wasn't too much hand handcrafted straight away. I mean, I edited a lot of bits. Um, I made a few new bass lines and sub bass, which is um, and yeah, tuned everything and stuff. So most of it you can drop in and put it into key and stuff. Yeah, yeah, and uh, it's amazing, like actually, to see that people are uh, picking up on your on your work on pieces of yeah. your work and reinterpreting it yeah definitely yeah i i think i do another one in the next in the next couple of months do a, do a volume two of it because um it seems like people really enjoyed that yeah yeah is there is there anything you would do differently if you were to start again i mean now you're gonna start, have another... the, start the sample pack again yes um yeah i was not very good at putting the putting all the clips together so when you when you hit the one shot it would if it was a hi-hat it would hit on the 1.13 it wasn't at the start so I'd make sure my starting points are all <laughs> correct but you know it was like I was working on this for a while and I was listening to the sample pack over and over and then it came to the point where I wanted to release on Bandcamp Friday 
Yeah. And, you know, it was 12 o'clock on Thursday night and I was like, shit, trying to export some stuff and make sure it was all, it was all right. And, and then in the end, I was like, oh, you know what? And I, I missed, I missed a bunch of stuff. I sh like, there's a few bits that I definitely missed. Yeah. Um, but I had some good like feedback from my pop and Instagram story when I was, when I was creating it. And, you know, I had my list of, um, I had my list of, uh, categories of what I was sounds I was going to make. And then some people yeah. were like, oh, well, what about why is there no atmospheres there? Or why is there no pads there? So I took that in and it was kind of give the people what they want in a way. Yeah. And uh, super interesting. Uh, I never did a sample pack. I don't know if I ever got the one. <laughs> <laughs> and but, it's also, it's also good for your own productions as well, because yeah. you, you can just load it up and it's all sat there and you can just click on it and you know, the sounds are yours. And, yeah. Uh, I was going to say, like, there is a lot of producers that I've seen, especially during lockdown, uh, Arjun Bagale, um, Chris Leeping, uh, yeah, and I think, uh, if I remember well, Kyle Geiger, Geiger um, put together, um, like, a Dropbox folder with a lot of sample packs from different producers, and I found oh, it very yeah, interesting. Nice. Yeah. yeah. Found it very cool. interesting. I see that. Yeah. Uh, if it's useful for, for people connecting, we'll, we'll put in the show notes in the yeah, description. Definitely. Yeah, yeah, I'd like to see that actually as well. Yeah, seems like a lot of people did sample packs right now. Yeah. Um, you know, I think also there's at the end of the day, there's a lot of DJs which are now unemployed, and that's the dark side of this corona. You know, there's people are living from touring, and now it went from like living and living a normal quality life to absolutely zero and a lot of people just struggling to pay the rent and i think offering offering merch offering sample packs offering these different things people are they are generating bits of income for themselves passive income it's not as much as what was yeah. back in the touring days but you know i don't think i don't think the artists should they shouldn't have to go and get a full-time job. They shouldn't have to go and retrain, you know, as the UK said, <laughs> this is not, this is not what it's about. That's not what they built their career on. So if there's any way to like, keep, keep artists afloat right now and keep them, to keep them still creating and being able to live without having to go and work at the restaurant or work at somewhere. I can't, can't even work at restaurants anymore. <laughs> They're all closed. Yeah. So. It, it is it's super interesting. The, I, I heard a podcast today, I don't remember who was the guest, but basically they were saying something like, um, it was a, from a Swedish person, I can't recall who is that, to basically say that he was an artist for some time in his life when he was young and, and supposedly, I mean, at the time where he was, he could go to university and the Swedish government provides a lot of like support, they're really protective with the population, so they allow a lot of people to try the artist's career even yeah. when they don't make enough money out of arts and yeah. they get a lot of a, uh, it's called a grant to support they financial have, they support. They have the grants. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. exactly. That's what, it, I mean, that's what it should be about. Definitely. Yeah. Obviously like there has to be limits, but you know, that the artists should be, they shouldn't have to like live in like 20 person squats on the outskirts of London, <laughs> you know, it's like, they're doing good stuff and you know if, if yeah. this court if this coach is taken away and uh, most of the year like the arts industry has suffered the most so um i mean in the uk they didn't give a lot of money to artists or like keep, try and keep them keep them alive you know it's pretty, pretty tough like uk it's uh i I'm, I'm also italian so i know italy was even worse <laughs> like the yeah, money exactly. that there is there is people with families unfortunately Italy that still have to receive money from march essentially yeah before. and that is like survival uh, next level survival super yeah, high it's ridiculous yeah. yeah yeah so i think that any money that these artists can make right now with with their music and with their with their with their creativity, then it's the only way right now. I think there's a lot of opportunities to to stay afloat, though. Luckily, oh indeed, yeah, yeah, for sure. And I I think we're gonna start going toward the Q and A. Yeah. And uh, I'm gonna ask you. I'm gonna line up a couple of questions. And guys who are listening, start typing your questions uh, on Facebook if you can, because it's easier for us to collect them. Or if not, on Instagram. And we're going to try to ask them to Sam. Um, 
one one thing that I, I read in a previous interview that yep. you you gave some time ago was uh, you get inspired. You, you listen to a lot of music, but yep. your techno gets inspired by the brutal side of life. Do you <laughs> do you remember? I don't know if you recall the interview, but uh, yes, I do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's uh, yeah. I mean, it's kind of a sad story, but I had a lot of deaths in my life. I had like my mum passing away just before like my uh. career started to take off. And I think that only inspired me to like do, to do well and to focus on this. And I think like sometimes the melancholy in my music is like maybe comes from, maybe comes from this side. From the tough part of from life. From the tough part of life, definitely from the struggles, yeah. yeah. I mean, I'm, ju I'm just lucky that everything worked out all right, you know. Like my, career, my career did well, but for some people who've also maybe had similar struggles, you know, maybe it carries yeah. on, but I think um, you really have to stay motivated um, yeah. and during these times and channel, channel that like, you know, channel that sadness or whatever into your music. The emotions um, into the, the emotions. Yeah, yeah, you got to. That's why, that's why I wrote a lot of experimental music and stuff like this. Was there any track that comes to mind now? I mean, uh, if it comes great, if not, we can move to the next one. But uh, yeah. is there any track that comes to mind that was inspired by a particular moment of darkness and or sadness? Of my productions? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. There was a track called Escape From You, and that's from uh, SK11 number four. And that's... that's um, that's about a girl. <laughs> <I> was, <laughs> <laughs> it sounds like that. <laughs> that was about a girl, and I was super caught up with this girl, and then, it, and then it never happened, and then I was just like, no, <laughs> it's the end. <laughs> Emotional guy. <laughs> <laughs> now I'm like, why the? F but you know, it makes good music. All these heartbreaks, all these times, they do make good music. Indeed, I mean, if you think about it, like uh, talking, if we think for a second about uh, music with lyrics, uh, probably <laughs> seventy-five percent comes from breakup, exactly, uh, like yeah. love stories exactly. that went wrong. Yeah, <laughs> well, it's definitely uh, uh, interesting. Uh, moving to, to a very different uh, side of you, which is yeah. kind kindness. I mean, you you for the little the. We, you and I interacted. You seem to be a very open, friendly, kind person. And yeah. I've also read in an interview that kindness has been one of your biggest values in life. Has always yeah, been. Yeah, definitely. I'd like uh, to say that I, I try and I try and do my best for sure. Because I mean, karma is also, you know, you got to believe in karma. You got to treat people how you want to be treated, and it's not, it doesn't always work that way sometimes. Yeah. Sometimes, sometimes I treat people way too kind than than I get back, which. Yeah. You know, that happens for sure. Um, that's like what, when I was saying with like, you know, these uh, at the start of Corona, giving away these band camp for free and all this stuff and trying to do these discounts. And, and you know, I uh, joined this uh, koala. Uh, they joined these Australian wildfires last year. I like gave a bunch of money to these koala foundations and mm -hmm. try and like, try and try and be as kind as possible to to everybody, yeah. including little animals like this little tiger here. <laughs> this messing around, hello tiger. Hello. <laughs> Is there, have you ever thought about where does that come from? Like, I mean, it could be from your past experiences, from your family or... I think, I think my family is just... Your super, family. <laughs> they're super sweet, yeah. Yeah. Bless them, yeah. They're all super sweet. As we say in English, you wouldn't say boot to a goose. <laughs> <laughs> wow, yeah. Uh, it, what what advice would you personally give to someone who is experiencing perhaps now a very dark moment in their life where they don't see light? Is yeah. there anything you would you you would say to this person? Maybe someone who's listening now. Find something to focus on. Yeah. Find something to like. Find something to put your energy in into. And I mean, if people are listening to this and they are they are making music, then find a way to that for that music to make you happy. I mean. It, if you're if you're stuck on if you're stuck on a project then just try and make some like maybe experimental music or express your emotions not just trying to build a techno track but you know just experiment this and maybe this is going to start resonating in your brain and you you feel like ah oh, i feel some relief of darkness or emotion because i'm putting it into this music 
if if we are talking mm -hmm. in musical terms, definitely it's all about focus. You know, I'm I'm not a big exerciser, but you know, some people say exercise is great for it is good for the taking away some things. But if we're talking about music, then just load something up and do something that you wouldn't do. Right. Uh, super interesting. I, I've spoke with probably a hundred producers in the last uh, few yeah, months, I bet. <laughs> <laughs> and and I, I would say that seventy percent has been really stuck at least at some point uh, for let's say for a protracted period of time. Uh, they went into a very dark place uh, in twenty twenty yeah. because of course all the reason the lockdown and. And I think I, I agree, like focus on something different or maybe doing collaboration seems to be... Uh, exactly. Yeah. If you can, if you're in a country which is only meeting one person, make sure that's the person you're going to collaborate with. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I think collaboration is really key as well because you can have such a good time with that one person making music and, uh, and sharing something. Yeah. It's... No, go ahead, go ahead. Carry on, carry on. Yes. I was I was just gonna say, like, and that in a way that inspires you, that pushes you also and, and inspires you. Yeah. Yeah, it really does. Yeah. And it can unlock some doors which maybe you wouldn't you also wouldn't uh, think to to do some things like that. And and then be on your personal solo studio session you can you can come up with some new ideas. Right, and I we have tons of questions from the audience. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm gonna I, try to be. <laughs> I hope my phone battery lasts. I just got a ten percent notification. Yeah, just... and we're gonna shut Instagram in uh, five minutes. So, guys, okay. please move to Facebook as soon as you can. We're gonna shut in five minutes, so we're gonna continue on Facebook. Okay, it should last until then. Yeah, uh, if it doesn't last, if we you lose us, guys, go on Facebook. You know, <laughs> <laughs> And uh, all right, so there is a question about um, sound design. Actually, two questions. One is, uh, is there? A... So actually, let's start with the basic one, which is from Tony. How do you approach sound design when you're starting off? Basically, do you read books? Do you work with a sound engineer? Do you get reference tracks or anything else? I would say YouTube is one of the best gifts that's been given to produce some music. Um, I would say the best thing is if you're working with Ableton, you know, just load up an operator synth and just start messing around and seeing what that's capable of. You know, you could just have one note, just draw in a C3 and um, just play that on a, on a one bar loop and just mess with them parameters and just mess around with what's do going on uh, and trying to work out how what's changing what sound and how how that's working i do i did read a lot of books i read um i read a bunch of books there's one which is um one by ableton is called 84 strategies for creative musicians i think mm. um there's another one that i got from amazon which is just about uh sound design and synthesis and these are all really handy because you can you know, you could read half an hour in the evening and in the next day you can have a bunch of new ideas because you're seeing how these things work, like how the different timbres are working with the oscillators and how the different shapes are changing. And um, I would also recommend uh, like getting into Reactor because Reactor is just, uh, yeah. Reactor is just endless sound design. Um, there's a whole bunch of ways to approach it, but I did read a lot of books and studied a lot on this and YouTube was just very helpful. Whatever sound you were trying to replicate, you know, you just type type in a kind of rough rough thing and it's gonna come up with something. There's a yeah. bunch of good people on YouTube nowadays. Yeah, I'm, all, I'm, I'm still learning. I'm still watching YouTube every day with different, different techniques and things. Of course, yeah, and, and I think I mean it's super important. I, I don't. Do, do you think you will ever stop learning? Like, you know? oh no, that's what makes it so fun. That's that's yeah. one of the main things that I think of why I'm so addicted to this is because I'm always learning. It's like a new, it's like a new thing every day. You don't get that with something else. I mean, you, you kind of with music is endless possibilities. It really is. Yeah, it does, and it, it makes a lot of sense. And. Right, there's another question related to this, which is: um, Is audio engineering uh, or helpful in achieving in achieving like a good level of sound? So, for example, if you were to think a split between production, raw production, and then audio engineering, how how important are these two in a finished track? 
like 70 30 percent or yeah i mean you're talking about creative process and then mixing yeah exactly let's, let's put it this way yeah you have to have both that's the thing you can't have the creative ideas and then a bad and then a bad like engineering it's yeah, you know, it's 50 50 honestly because you, you could have all the creative ideas in the world but then if you can't if you can't get that if you can't get that final mix right then I prefer, I prefer to listen to like, uh, you know, it has to be pleasing on the ears. Actually, I prefer to listen to like a less creative track that sounds more pleasing, to be honest. Yeah. On the case, instead, of like, instead of like a crazy, wacky, creative track, <laughs> it's like, whoa, it's a bit nasty. Yeah. Uh, um, yeah, it makes sense. But I, 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 stu I say study both, you know, there's, a, there's mixing and mastering courses and books and stuff like that, and they can, they can just help. And then... It, it sometimes also unlocks the creativity when you can get that sound to like when you can get the sound to the sound right and well mixed it can also unlock the unlock the rest of the creative process because then you know like how to fit different sounds into what frequencies and things like this yeah and in, in a way like the even when you're learning something creative like you, you're gonna start your brain activates and, and you start thinking about stuff like you were saying two moments ago about reading a night and then the day after experimenting with your music. Yeah, yeah, experimenting with the new stuff that you've learned in maybe that evening, you know, making some notes. I've got I've got I've got so many books around here where I've just taken notes from different things and and also like uh analyze different tracks. A track that I would like, I'll just listen to it. And I'd write in for like arrangement techniques, I'd write in like, you know, hi hat 30 seconds, you know rising uh, synth sound from 30 to one minute 30. Mm -hmm. And if you, if you do that a few times, you don't, it kind of locks into your brain. It's just like studying, it's just like impulsive then. You don't need to go back to that book and look, read it. You know, you just sort of yeah. get engrave it into your brain after like so many months of- Doing that. And it's, it's like- intuitive, yeah. It's like muscle memory, like for- Yeah, records. exactly. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, and there, there is a set of questions around your production. Yeah. Um, someone is saying, you mentioned five years is approximately a good time for someone to develop their sound. Like, give or take, yeah. Give or take. Yeah. Um, and to get there, like, okay, of course, trying reference tracks, uh, uh, how do you start, like, maybe let's put it this way, how can you make progress faster? Is it by, by studying? taking lessons or just take, experimenting. You, I mean, you can take the fast lane. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you can go, you can go and study that course, you know, five days a week, full time. You can go get taught by somebody. Somebody's going to tell you exactly what to do and how to do it. But sometimes that doesn't always make the best, the best, um, the best producer, you know, it could make them the best producer fundamentally. And on paper, you might get a degree and you might be, you might be getting a first in your sound design course or something, but it doesn't technically make you the best producer. Yeah. But you know, you do have to work hard at it. And I mean, if you, if you can go to university and study this, I personally don't recommend it so much. Yeah. I didn't go, I didn't, I didn't study this. I just spent a lot of time doing it <laughs> by myself. And I, t I taught myself like everything. But there's some people there that you can go and get taught by somebody. But is that from you or is that from the teacher? Is that from a book? So, yeah. and, and <clears throat> without saying it, I mean, uh, it's not to say that all the courses are shit, but like the, what, what tends to happen, I've done a music course, for example, and I found it amazing for me. It worked out yeah. really well. And but I've heard a lot of people that say that you, you get a lot of theory in the course. So someone like helps you interpret a book or read a book. Yeah. Yeah. However, that is like 20% or not even of the process. Like yeah. you don't, you don't try yourself. Like exactly. Yeah. Yeah. You can study all your life, but if you're not getting your hands dirty, then <laughs> it's not gonna, you can't get it to work. I mean, I would, I would love to go and study. Don't get me wrong. And I think it does, it does put you in the fast lane for sure. Um, some people don't get the opportunity. Other people do. So. It's all about finding what works for you. Part-time courses are great, like evening classes are so many, uh, are so many, I mean, it used to be, you know, go and sit in a classroom with 20 people on a Tuesday night and study from <laughs> seven till nine and like, go. Yeah. and you can, you can learn a lot from this for sure. And it's nice to be able to ask questions and stuff, yeah.
and connect with other peers like yeah yeah students. exactly yeah. it doesn't always have to be like <laughs> grafting away on your own like, oh no <laughs> <laughs> the, the lone life of the lone range, <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah uh, Sam, let's do the last 10 minutes on Facebook before your okay. phone cuts off. Yes, we're getting close. All right, see you on Friends Facebook. on Instagram, uh, move to Instagram. Thank you for Mr. joining. Mr. Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Facebook, Facebook, Facebook the other Facebook. way. <laughs> <laughs> All right, and, and, okay, perfect. And, all right, so we got some other questions, sir. Huh? Uh, there is a bunch of technical questions set. I we think we can answer a few technical questions if okay. uh, I can say yes or no. Okay, okay, let's do that. So, uh, what do you start? Do you start with with drums or something else when you make tracks? Starting with drums, I think that's a solid foundation. You gotta get that drum sounding right, but don't focus all your attention on it because otherwise you're gonna be listening to uh, you're gonna be listening to kick drums Techno. <laughs> yeah you're gonna be <laughs> you're gonna be listening to kick drums and sometimes sometimes it's nice just to fat craft them afterwards as well you can mm -hmm. but start start with a nice basis yeah start with good foundations yeah and do you blend do you have any effective ways to to create rumbles or yeah. like a rolling bass yeah Anything you can share like you know i know it's a I think the best the best method is still the reverb method. Still the reverb on a send, send your kick drum to the reverb and then um, distort it, put it in a parallel distortion um, and then resample that layer and mm -hmm. lay, layer it with some toms to add the groove. You can side chain that reverb rumble to the toms and then underneath that you can add a sine wave to give it that presence of of only of only like a raw bass but then the textures above that are going to give it that depth and that uh, har uh, extra harmonics yeah and, and it seems to be like one of the, the um, finest uh, ways to, to develop a, a, like a groovy track like instead Still of putting is. something even when you do like a 4-4 beat yeah that is that is basically the way to create the groove out of the Re kick. Reverb is still is still the best thing. In in old tracks, if you listen closely, you can hear a little bit of reverb, even if it's not a reverb bass. Yeah, and of course to create a bit of space and, and uh, exactly uh, yeah. width in, uh, with, in the bass. Exactly, yeah. yeah. And uh, how do you approach creating space in your tracks? In the old track, in the old mix? In the whole mix. It's all about panning and about using a uh, stereo wideners. If you can get your hands on a stereo widener, I always use this one from Waves, it's called S1. Mm -hmm. um, that's a really good one, but I think there's some free ones out there as well. Um, just panning stuff to the left and the right and um, your pads and making sure everything's EQ'd. Just, you can also just put some slight cuts in various places to free up the space for like more important sounds. Yeah, and using reverbs to create drops depth, do you use them in in uh, send and return, or basically in parallel, or you use them in direct? I use them in uh, in ascend and return on parallel, and if I just wanted to create, um, if I just wanted to make space in like a hi hat, then I'd have it on a super sh tiny dry wet and a super short decay. I don't want to like start messing with that sound too much because then it's going to change the artifacts in the sound. Yeah, and it, are you using any some any sort of like side chain compression on different sounds? Oh, I, everywhere, side chain and everything. <laughs> Not to the kick, you know, but like <laughs> I, I, I side chain like a pad to a hi hat or something, or you know, in in various different in various different ways or adds to the, to the feel and the movement and stuff like this when it's not always side chain to the kick it gets this like pumping feel but if you side chain like the hi-hats another element then you can make the groove start to move in a certain way because, because people who, uh, you don't always need to side chain into the kick yeah some things can overlap with the kick as well it doesn't always have to be away from the kick it can also hit on the on the Basically, to, to, yeah, exactly. So you, you use it creatively to create, uh, I guess, grooves or patterns that are a bit exactly. less different, more, more different than the four four. 
yeah and also ghost ghost side chains as well so like a muted side chain that's also uh, to add in a different pattern as well right and camela this was for you camela just asked this question and uh, moving toward uh, like uh, your performances or the industry as a whole uh, there's a bunch of people asking uh, you need to come to Colombia. Uh, <laughs> I'll be back but, soon. <laughs> uh, wh when are you coming back to London? Uh, that's <laughs> um, and so let me try to pick two questions. Hmm. Uh, to work, music labor. Okay. So let, let's start with, with this, like Manchester, your <laughs> in a way like you're almost your hometown yes what do you think about the scene of the manchester techno electronic music scene at the moment uh, and uh, any plans for you to specifically collaborate more with anyone i know yant is one of them yes yant is one of them um there is a lot of good producers in manchester um and before this whole corona situation i know that like the vibe at the y hotel was pretty was pretty good and you know meat free bless you now that they were they were doing some quality events that so they'll bring us some real good techno acts um as for now it's a little bit of a shame but i kind of lost a little bit of touch with there um so i can't think of anybody off the top of my head apart from Yant. and you know like this there's a guy alex morgan he produces under a morgan Oh, um, he, he's making some really, really cool stuff at the moment. So there's still a lot of good music coming out of Manchester, as it has been for the past past many years. You know, Samuel Carriage, A and D, all these guys are all from Manchester. Stephanie Sykes, she was in Manchester for a long time. Um, so I would, after all this stuff clears away, then I'd really love to go and play back in Manchester and do a, do like an SK party at the White Hotel or something with Yant and a few other people. Yeah, that would be great. And yeah. I think, I mean, uh, is Jordan there still? Ah, or? Mr. Cleric, yes, he is indeed still there. Yeah, yeah, he's yeah. there. Yeah, yep, he is holding yeah. the fort. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and this is a broader question from Xav. Yeah. Um, how do you think the scene, let's talk about techno, will emerge after this period? Before lockdown, there was a trend on a broken beat. Uh, I guess that was like a bit earlier than 2020. And then eventually that became some kind of harder, trendier stuff. Yeah. Do you have any, any view on what will be next in terms of I, style? In terms of style, I think that this cold groovy stuff, which is being played by uh, Freddie K, DBS1, and like a lot of these younger people, Rene Wise, Jans, all these kids, and Maron, the Dutch scene, they're all playing this groovy stuff. It's like, I mean, it's still like 140, maybe even faster than that sometimes, but you know, it's it's real techno. It has the rides, it has the claps. It's reminiscent of like 90s style stuff, but in a modern twist. And I think this is only going to get stronger. Um, I think that this hard stuff is really being separated into a into a certain style, like this hard style trance and stuff like this is being separated, and this other style of groovy stuff is that the lineups are now being separated. I mean, before, I, for instance, I would play in a lineup with you know a hard style DJ I played before them, but now it's like there's separate lines, for separate styles within techno. Yeah. So I think it's going to only continue, maybe to separate in a, for a good cause. In the market, I, I believe the market was expanding massively, like before the coronavirus. Uh, there was yeah. the mainstream techno Whoa, yeah. going ma massive, it's and so now much. and now there is the. I mean, I guess there is the always the experimental. There is kind of parallel to the yeah. club techno, and yeah. now the club techno is probably. I, I, I agree with you. Is splitting in uh, the ravey and then the more groovy stuff. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Yeah, I mean this this whole business techno stuff was techno stuff was going insane before this corona stuff. I I I think that stuff is just going to continue. That's I think so. Be, you know, yeah, big money, those. big audiences, and it's... and you know these promoters uh, they have to make their money back from this time now as well. They're only going to want to book the top top twenty DJs in the world. You know, DJ my top twenty. They're just going to want to book these people again. 
yeah it's going to continue like that and also because i mean most of the big promoters they have paid already part of the fees of the headliners for 2020. This, yeah exactly that's very true that's a good point yeah yeah so the, <laughs> the headliners continue. <laughs> first on in line yeah <laughs> no, sure. esca no, no escape no escape from that <laughs> Uh, and then, okay, so question from Matasism, how, what do you think about the current vinyl techno market, uh, since you're pressing vinyls, uh, um, do you think the prices of, between distribution and pressing are too high for labels to sustain? Yeah, uh, the thing is that the records are selling well, I mean, it definitely since I started pressing records, it has gone up a lot. I used to pay a certain cost price and now I pay another cost price, which is eating ate out a lot of my, a, a lot of the return before it'd be like 100 records, you would break even 150 yeah. records, you would break even now it's pushing up to 180 break even. So you have to sell at least 180 records to cover your costs, which is quite high still. Um, but I think the vinyl market is still, is still very strong right now. Yeah. Um, people are people are buying records. Uh, they're buy, buying records to maybe play at home. You know, during this time, maybe they bought a set of twelve tens and they started mixing records to entertain themselves. So, I think the vinyl market is still very, still pushing up more and more. Yeah, and how many copies do you press on average for your press? We, I did three hundred on the last one, and I just, as I said, it sold out in sold a week. Out. So now I have two hundred repress, but always starting off at three hundred. To test. to test it yeah because you never know like like we were talking about you never know if that record starts to get popular or if it just kind of flows to the side a little bit which some record good records do just not get so popular but that's the look of the draw isn't it yeah no of course and is there um i'm not gonna ask you who is the, who is pressing them because we might just uh, overcrowd them with more demand <laughs> <laughs> and it might be more difficult for you yeah, to press <laughs> after this this podcast yep. but uh, <laughs> and so basically like for people who've never done a record like uh, the economics are mind-blowing in a way right so you yeah. paint something I, I don't know it really depends on like what type of vinyl you get like what press is pressing it for you what type exactly. of artifacts you want to put artwork and that kind of stuff but yep. the, that you press it like the cost for each record the, it's between three and seven euros, right? So the cost of producing, depending on yeah, depending what you, on what you get. Yeah, wow. Yeah, yeah between, exactly. Between, I would say three is the bare minimum. That's like your white label, hand stamped, plain sleeve. That's that's going to cost you three euros. Yeah. Um, and then anything upwards of that, you want to start getting color artwork, or you want a you want a full color sleeve. You want all these different little extras, everything extra is like 50 pence. So or 50 per copy, cents, sorry, yeah. per copy. So you go 354, 455. And it's just, it can go up as much as you want. Like for my last record, I wanted to do a gatefold. So it would just, it would open, you know, like this. And this was, oh, <laughs> no, 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 I don't want it anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I'm fine. And, yeah. uh, and, and basically what, what, what tends to happen is that you sell it on Bandcamp or uh, if you really hand it over to a shop you retain uh, nine euros uh, ten euros maximum top if the record yeah. is selling at two if you're lucky yeah if yeah, you're yeah. selling to a distributor you probably get back five six so de depending on the the agreement you have but yes indeed if you sell out is still a hard job like to recover the money if you have a remix for example a remixer for example exactly because is... minimum you know you, you could be paying remix of 300 euros if that's probably the lower lower end of a uh, lower end of a good remix of 300 so yeah there's there's a lot to break even and i think that's why that's why there's not so many only vinyl labels left anymore because people are people are making the cost back from digital sales so you know like Fred, freddie k and his key vinyl he's yeah you know he's only vinyl no you can't find digital anywhere no band camp no nothing so you know it yeah. takes a it takes a lot of risk to do only only vinyl really yeah and i, and I guess that no, as you said like you need to record the cost by uh, with digital or yep. because the label uh, or actually the record rather becomes your calling card like your business card where yep. People book you for that, and then you make the money with a showcase of the label or with your 
you know, very we, true yeah yeah definitely people can cover cost back from gigs and different things like this they can calculate if if they're getting booked for this gig or something or you know you put out a good yeah. record then then it all starts to come back uh, in various ways but it, it is a very difficult job <laughs> to do mm -hmm. yeah. uh, and, and going towards the wrap up i'll ask you the last two questions from the audience and then we wrap up with the few rapid questions from us uh linda is asking uh, um she's from colombia she admires you a lot and uh, <laughs> she looks forward to seeing you again and she's mm -hmm. asking uh, do you have any advice for someone who wants to work in a music label and i guess we're thinking about independent techno labels <laughs> yes exactly um you can approach these for sure send them an email about what you're doing i mean there's there's also i mean there's also a lot of um music business courses now at university and sometimes these are a great avenue to get into because um maybe the university has job opportunities with various places i've got friends that work for universal and k7 and all these bigger labels working for a smaller independent label there's not a lot of money involved that's the thing you can do you can do bits of internship but you know you have to go to the major labels domino universal to get to get a pay slip at the end every month yeah or you do it uh, it's your side gig you do it because yeah you love it. just because you love it exactly yeah you should just drop drop your drop the people an email introduce yourself some people sometimes they need a hand doing different jobs you know replying to some emails and stuff sometimes it works we, we actually have uh, alex uh, who is working with us and he reached out to, by sending an email and we it's now working with us and again like yeah. we, we are not yet uh, able to pay salaries but i think it's a start it, yeah it, definitely and it's and, it, and i mean it's good for a cv you know they can you can say that you have this work experience at these at these places and you just do it for free or like whatever's minimum payment but you can put it on your cv and say that you did these jobs and it's you could then in in a couple of years you can go and work at a, a major label or something like that because you can see you have a good history of uh, working in music no matter how small or big yeah, and you make your contacts experience and you move from there. Yeah. Uh, last question from the audience from Eric. Uh, uh, was there a moment in your life history where you understood you could make of music your life, your main occupation? You decided to leave everything else to concentrate. It st still, feels, still feels alien to me now, to be honest. <laughs> yeah, I've been in a very privileged position to be able to, uh, to live my life in, from music. And I didn't, actually, I didn't actually aim for any of this. It just it just all happens you know you start releasing records because it's your passion and then you know you start getting booked and i remember when i first moved to berlin i was working at a few different restaurants you know in the back slaving away 12 hour shifts and at some point i had to i had to say like oh i can't work that shift because i've got to go to a gig i can't work that shift because i've got to go to a gig or like i need more time because i have all these little bits of jobs to do and at the end, at the end, I was working like four hours a week and I was like, well, actually, I don't need this anymore. And it just kind of happened slowly and slowly. It wasn't like, OK, I quit everything. I'm going to do music. It just happened very gradually. And I think that's all to do with patience as well. Just things start happening and falling into place more and more. So to quit a job and focus on music, if you can finance it, but very yeah. hard. At least with, 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 the, with our kind of music, it's, it is very hard. Yeah, definitely. But guys, don't uh, don't uh, give up. <laughs> don't give up. No way. Definitely not. Uh, and all right. Thank you. And uh, last quick questions from uh, Almost Sound. Uh, what's your secret weapon in music or beyond as a person? Secret weapon. Mate. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Here we go. <laughs> Caffeine. Caffeine, yeah. <laughs> Caffeine and cigarettes. <laughs> <laughs> I, lo I love Matt. Uh, <laughs> coffee, coffee and cigarettes keeps me alive. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, how many, how many Mattes do you drink per week? Let's say on average. What, uh, what, I, I drink one a day for sure. It's, okay. not, hel it's not healthy. <laughs> not healthy. Well, but that's not that's not including the cups of coffee or the green tea. <laughs> I, I, I'm in the same camp. Yeah. It's, it's our, uh, and uh, who, who is a guest that you think we should really speak with and why? Um, oh, I should have thought about that question. Um, I think I'd love to hear like what somebody like DVS1 would have to say. 
yeah I've, he's just such an interesting character i'd love to watch i'd love to watch an interview with him um somebody more like <laughs> oh, let me... come back to you <laughs> no worries, no worries. We, we can move to the next one and last question and then uh so what question would you like us to ask to the next guest without knowing who they're going to be um how do you find structure <laughs> how, how, how do you how do you schedule your career and your label for instance and how do you make sure it all fits into place because i can't do this <laughs> i know it's okay <laughs> it's a great question and not not easy to answer uh exactly how, how do you how do you manage like to juggle all these different things because you really have to have discipline and structure do you wake up at 9 a.m and start sending emails at 10 a.m you have your breakfast at 11 you go to the studio at three you come home <laughs> Yeah, uh, I'm, I'm curious. I'm really yeah, curious as well. Exactly. <laughs> and maybe, uh, maybe some people have got it locked down. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I'm curious to know. I'll, I'll let you know what, what's going to be the outcome. <laughs> yeah. And as you might imagine, there is a question from our previous guest, which is, yep. um, what is your favorite dish? Wow. Mate doesn't count. Mate doesn't count. <laughs> Damn. <laughs> you know what? I love pizza. Uh. <laughs> classic of course classic of course but zola i do love zola pizza in uh, uh kreuzberg in kreuzberg yeah zola like it once <laughs> i think once i think once a week i'm eating this well, definitely at least <laughs> at least yeah exactly <laughs> Uh, pizza or fish and chips <laughs> I'm, I, I'm completely sold that you're speaking with an italian yeah, pizza exactly. lover <laughs> oh, it's the best or cheese or cheese fondue cheese fondue okay wow oh, cheese fondue is also good anything with cheese yeah I'm obsessed with it cheese fondue i hope like we're gonna find like a place in berlin where we can go back uh, exactly. at some point or, yeah. or london or yeah yeah. I look at, luckily I have a few Swiss friends which uh, <laughs> provide the, provide, the, <laughs> provide the ingredients. Nice. Uh, Sam, this has been a great pleasure. Super Thank fun you interview. So much. Thanks. Thank you for being with us. Any, any latest projects uh, where uh, people should look at if they're interested? I'm sure we have tons of people who are really interested in what you do. Check, uh, check, out, check out that next uh, Archon record on SK11X and for me, I am going to work on some uh, album tracks for the next few months. I don't want to rush it. I'm going to keep everything, going to keep everything, uh, educating myself and um, coming up with some new ideas for this like IDM style album. Mm -hmm. Well, not, not techno stuff like from 90 BPM to 170. So I'm going to focus on that. I'm not going to plan anything now because I just did a double pack. So I'm going to keep it. Keep yeah, chill for a little while. Next thing I do is probably the album. Yeah, and and so the album is going to be on uh, SK11. Yeah, 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 yeah. Very cool. Yeah. When, and when is Arkans record due? Uh, end of January. Very cool. Yeah. yeah. We'll make sure to include that also when when that mm -hmm. that's out, and I'll include your sample pack for sure. Oh, nice. Thank you. Uh, and that's it. Uh, really good to speak with you, man. Bye bye. <laughs> bye, -bye. <laughs> <laughs> thanks a lot nice. Joseph. Thank my you. pleasure our pleasure to have you and thanks to everyone who tuned in and stayed with us until now yeah thanks a lot everyone until Hope next time insight. yeah keep an eye out on homo sound you're doing some good stuff oh thanks man thank you <laughs> see you later ciao okay guys this is joseph and this is the outro if you really like the content i wanted to ask you please consider liking us on instagram or leaving a review on the podcast whether you're using that on apple is very useful for us and your comment makes us all of our work worth it also if you have any guests that you really would like us to chat with let us know we take any suggestion or any feedback and we use it to improve and direct what we're going to do next if you're a producer and you're interested in master classes with artists such as Scalameria, VSK, Romek, Lag, and many more, you can now check our website homosound.co.uk. We have plenty of classes and more are coming as well. So brace yourself, you're gonna get a lot of content. And one last thing, shout out for Vlad for editing this podcast and Declan for creating the content that you all see on social media. 
Plus, of course, uh, big thanks to Juliana, Flaminia, Alessandro and Rick from Tavefeed for all the rest of the work at Homo Sound. Thank you so much for listening. See you next time at Homo Sound.